sharpen pencils, clear your desk. It's time to increase your nerdiness with Derek. And hello once again, I'm Derek W. Truesdale, the internet's least known nerd. I'm pretty sure that's the case. I'm here once again to increase your nerdiness. It is a civic duty that I provide for all of you geeks out there on the interweb. We discuss video making in particular, but it could be anything that pertains to nerdiness. You like that, how I, I use the root word and the definition? Those are my... Hi, this is Derek. Allow me to pause on this embarrassing freeze frame to remind you that portions of this program not affecting the outcome of the show have been removed. Yeah, they were just too darn boring. And I know what you're thinking. This was even more boring. My favorite things in the Webster's Dictionary. Um, it's like, persistence. The state of being persistent. What? That doesn't help me at all. All right. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll explain things more than that right here on the show. Anyhow, last week we were talking about containers. The things that hold your favorite video files. And I have a couple questions from the viewer feedback. First off, one viewer asks, can every codec go into every container? Well, no. It, it really depends on the specifications that the container designer guys allow to fit into it. And sometimes as technology advances, we reach the point where the old container type becomes a bit of a hack. For example, XVID videos many times live <clears throat> many times rather live within an AVI container, which is kind of a hack, but you could still get it to fit inside through some clever footwork. But then on the other hand, you can't always expect your friends to be able to play it back. They have to have the same thing installed on your system. More on Codex later in the show. Uh, next question: What's the best container for say? Uh, video for PC or the internet. Is there a best kind of container? Well, to me, that just depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're making a DVD, then you have some kind of DVD builder that you use. If you're going on the internet, well, just uh, use whatever container type suits your movie. YouTube takes pretty much anything these days, which is fantastic. Uh, one wonderful container, I'm not sure if I mentioned it last week, is the MKV, which is a Matroska video file. And you can fit, I mean, just about anything in it. And an, an unlimited number of streams are practically unlimited. I don't know if it really is. This, there's probably some guy who tested it. They're like, no, uh, after like... Five billion streams. It wouldn't let me fit anymore. I, I don't know, but MKVs are very versatile. They can fit in a, a ton of things, and it, it's it's just um, it's a really cool container type. But a lot of times, if you're sending a video to a friend, MP4s are great, and so your mileage may vary. Uh, another question, sort of related to containers and stuff. Another viewer asks, what do you think of the move from Google to plan to drop H.264 in Chrome in favor of the inferior but open source and free VP8 codec? Well, that's sort of a... It's sort of an industry news follower guy's question. In essence, it doesn't really mean much because... <laughs> While Chrome won't natively have support for this, it's going to be done through Flash anyway. So I guess it's like Google giving a big thank you to Adobe and allowing them to continue to be the container of choice on the Internet. Um, will it have that much of an effect? I don't know. Time will tell. That may be an obstacle for the future, way off in the future, but at this point, it doesn't really change much. However, I will say, I would love us to go to something that's more open, or at least <laughs> something that has a team of Google's lawyers behind it, so I won't have to worry about getting my butt sued. I do like that idea, but, you know, it takes time to advance to this kind of thing. Uh, one more question. What do you think of the HEVC successor of H.264 in terms of quality? I'll be honest. I don't know yet. 
I'm uh, I'm definitely not an early adopter on this stuff. I try to keep an eye on it, and I like to hear about the latest developments. But if you take something like H.264, when it first came out, you had to have a monster machine to be able to do it. And it was sort of, uh, there There weren't a lot of good tools. It, it takes time for this stuff to catch up and, and pick up speed and have a lot of support. I just wait for that to happen, which is why I still have Windows XP. I got a nice comment where someone was like, ah, you have Windows XP. And for me, I love my stuff to be well supported. And so, uh, yeah, it doesn't bother me. I keep an eye on it, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, I wouldn't be running off this dual-core processor if I cared that much about it. Boop! Spontaneous edit! Let's bump right back in into the topic of the week, Codex! Last week we talked about containers that hold your favorite video files. Now it's time to talk about the nuts and bolts of how your video gets squashed down into something smaller. Now this is done with something called Codex. For example, if I take one of my AVI files from the computer and get the information with media info as we discussed last week, you will see the codec that is responsible for crunching down your video in the video stream or the audio stream. Now this is an, ab an abbreviation. The word codec comes from the whole idea of encode and decode. It crunches it down, it stretches it out. Now here's the thing, there are base basically two kinds of ways to do this. One of them is with lossless compression. And it, it, it takes down your, uh, it takes your video and without sacrificing quality, it sort of shaves off the edges, makes it a little bit smaller, but it, at no point does it sacrifice quality. So exactly what the decoder was fed is what it spits out on the other end. That's lossless compression. Now, as it may sound, it's going to take more space to do that because I'm saying you we're talking a mathematical one-to-one -one correlation from what you gave in to what came out. Now, if you're watching me on the internet, you're probably not looking at like the 100th pixel from the left and the, the, the 56th one down and you're like, Ooh, I just saw a little bit of noise flash. Wow, I'm glad that that one little speck that just got 20% brighter. That's really important stuff. I'm glad we captured that. We wouldn't want to sacrifice any quality, would you? Well, in lossless compression, <laughs> you would have to worry about that stuff. Now, the other way to do this is with lossy compression. And it actually does discard some of the data. So, for example, DV, I believe, is uh, about a 5 to 1 compression ratio, which means it throws out 80% of the information coming in. Da, da, da. I know, 80%. Sounds pretty bad, right? But fear not, there are some pretty clever ways of doing that. And you might have noticed from my one pixel analogy, it's not always that important that some little tiny part of your pixel is reproduced 100% accurately. Otherwise, you guys wouldn't be able to watch me live on the internet. It would be impossible because my upload speed sure couldn't handle that. I've got Time Warner. I mean, they're trying to sell me more TV and phone service. I just want the connection and I don't want to starve to death. Please just let me have that. Internet video is obviously one of the uses for lossy compression. Now, at some future point, we'll talk about the actual nuts and bolts of how comp video compression works in excruciating detail. I'm sure you'll <laughs> enjoy it. But let's talk a little about um, some of the different methods of compression. Now, this lossless compression tends to not have a bunch of keyframes, meaning it, it takes every frame what is called an intra frame, which is just what's in it, and it compresses it individually, almost like it was a JPEG image. That's sort of the bulk of the work that a lot of these lossless compressors do. They just kind of take a frame at a time. But lossy compression, especially for the internet or your Blu-ray discs, uh, 
your DVDs you have lying around, they use this keyframe-based things where they have something called a GOP, which is a, I believe it's group of pictures or something like that. And on DVD, pretty much every half a second, there's something called a keyframe. And it's one frame that, that can be decoded perfectly. But here's the catch. The next 14 frames or so are going to be based off that. It's going to it's gonna be like, okay, you remember that frame way back there? Add this to it. So, for example, you're looking at my background, and if one of the spots was just black, it would say, um, okay, now you are 20% black or whatever it is. I want you to stay that color until I tell you to change. That's pretty much how it works, by eliminating redundancy. Again, at some point, we'll get to the nuts and bolts of it, but, but this is what a codec is responsible for. Some of the variables we have in codecs are the bit rate. That's how much of your hard drive is this video going to fill up, or how much of your DVD. That's obviously a concern. A lot of people wouldn't be happy if they got to the end of their precious Twilight movie and then they're like, ooh, you know, this all didn't fit on the disc. It kind of ran out of space. You'd be a little unhappy about that. Or if you're watching on the internet, it would be a little disappointing if, 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 if it got out all the time. It's pretty hard to watch video in that fashion. So uh, this is why we have the bit rate, which is a way to squeeze it down and say, all right, you've got this much information, but only that much can go out. There are a couple different strategies of encoding. Sometimes with the codec, all the stress will be put on the encoder, on the encoding side. For example, your DVD disc. A lot of these are made by professional studios from guys who really know their stuff. And they'll spend a lot of time rendering and fine-tuning this stuff and tweaking it. If you've ever rendered out a DVD, some of you may have experienced the pain of you kind of look at your watch and you're like, man, I could watch this video in a half hour. How come it takes an hour to finish? This thing takes forever. Well, sometimes they don't mind putting the stress on the encoder, but of course, on the decoder, when you play it back, you want a whole bunch of cheap $30 DVD players to do it. So those are some of the strategies. Are, is it going to render in real time? Does it have to have a certain amount to go out on the internet right now? Or is it maybe part of it uses a lot, part of it uses a little, but as long as it fits on the disc, that's fine. So bitrate is one way of, of uh, chopping this stuff down. And remember, some of it has keyframes, so every few frames, there's uh, a frame that, that can be decoded fine, but then it'll have a stream of ones after it that depend on that. So sometimes if there's a break in the stream, if you have an HD antenna and your programming glitches and you get these this pixelation every now and then, or it happens on satellite TV, that's probably because you missed a keyframe. It wasn't able to catch up. So it's like, yeah, I don't know what to make of this. Here's a bunch of blocks. And uh, so those are some of the issues there. Okay, one more spontaneous editing point as we uh, <laughs> wrap up the show here. The trend of modern video codecs is to put more load on your CPU than on at the expense or at the benefit, rather, of uh, saving some bandwidth. I'll give you an example. My brother, I fixed him up this old computer that a company was throwing out. It was kind of a junky computer. He can do a lot of things on the internet, but the one thing he has trouble with is viewing internet video. This is because a computer back then wouldn't be able to handle it. But now that we have some faster machines, we're able to do some more advanced things with the encoding and squeeze out some more quality um, while saving some bits. So since hardware has gotten cheaper, we're making more use of it and, um, and saving some space. So now we can have a YouTube video that doesn't look like poop like it used to. 
the modern codecs tend to uh, to get better and better and better. But there kind of is a point where you can't squash it down anymore. There are principles of compression which we'll be talking about at some point. But that's another show for another day. Anyhow, I thank you for increasing your nerdiness once again. And we'll see you next time, folks. Sharpen pencils, clear your desk. It's time to increase your nerdiness with Derek.